I'm George Gallo, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free word. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but discussing Yemen. The proximate reason for this discussion is revelations over the last few weeks that there may be a secret group of 30 British special forces operating out of the Al Ghada airport in a province in eastern Yemen. My answer to that question would be well, is the Pope a Catholic? After all, the British government is up to its neck in the Saudi-led coalition annihilation of huge numbers of civilian people in Yemen through starvation, where millions of children live now permanently on the brink of famine, prey to disease, infections of all kinds, and of course, prey to the rockets, bombs, and missiles supplied to that coalition by Britain and the United States of America. So why would there be any inhibition at all about interposing British special forces into the battlefield? Well, first of all, it would be illegal. Uh, the British government has denied involvement in the coalition's war against the people of Yemen. Secondly, Parliament has not been informed of this deployment, which it would have to be according to the conventions introduced into Parliament under the premiership of Tony Blair and followed, by and large, by every Prime Minister since. And thirdly, it would be catastrophic in public relations terms. Because in the Al Qaeda airport is a torture chamber. You don't have to believe me. You probably want to believe Human Rights Watch instead. Hardly a citadel of propaganda for the Houthi cause. Human Rights Watch has carefully catalogued a series of horrific human rights abuses being carried out at that airport, including forced disappearance and torture on a massive scale in an airfield where there's a cell of British armed military personnel, if recent reports are to be believed. It's therefore, at least for us in Britain, an important question. Has Parliament been deceived? Has the government been lying? And are British soldiers in Yemen with blood on their hands? It's a big question, Bob, isn't it? You are a defense and security expert, good friend of the show, a man steeped in bomb disposal and intelligence work in your long and distinguished uh, military career. But you've also worked uh, for the UN. You've worked for NATO. Did this report have the ring of truth to you? Well, George, I, what I would say is I, no one, as you said quite rightly, would be surprised at the fact that there are British special forces um, based in Yemen, um, since you know the, the whole point of a uh, sense of future war will be more asymmetrical. It, um, you know, Yemen is uh, strategically positioned in terms of controlling uh, you know the, the straits between the, the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Um, so ultimately, it's always been a place of uh, of interest for everybody in that region, and um, and certainly against the uh, the GCC. You know, they're worried about the Houthis being supplied by Iran. So ultimately. Um, because neither, no one wants to, in a sense, see the other side influence greater than theirs. Of course, in a sense, um, special forces are going to be involved. Well, it might not be surprising, but it would be surprising to Parliament, uh, who haven't been told about it. It would be surprising to those who believe our government should tell us the truth, because the government have denied it. So what you're saying, and I agree with you, by the way, it wouldn't be surprising. 
which means we both concluded that we're governed by liars and Parliament is something that can be dispensed with at any time. Well, I imagine the, the MOD would just want to keep special forces operations secret for as long as they possibly can, not out in the wider world. Uh, Hugh Barnes, you're a very distinguished war correspondent. You've been in some real scrapes in uh, all kinds of theatres I see uh, since I last met you 35 years ago, including Afghanistan, the Balkans, Chechnya. Um, is it, in your view, surprising or not surprising? that there may well be British special forces actually fighting in the war in Yemen. It's not surprising in my view. Um, in some of those scrapes that you mentioned, Afghanistan particularly, because the British didn't have quite the same involvement in Chechnya, when I was wandering around on the ground as a war reporter, I frequently came across British secret operatives on the ground, you know, basically kind of identifying targets that could then be bombed from the air. So it, it's, not, it's not surprising to me at all. I think it's almost inevitable that the British military would be involved in this disgraceful uh, foreign venture. But I would say that I think it's a slightly technical detail to sort of worry too much about, you know, the secrecy of military operations uh, in, a, in a war zone. I mean, you know, fighting colonial wars is not a public relations exercise, and it's undertaken by unseen, unelected, secret commanders. And when I was growing up, there used to be something called the Royal Tournament that people used to buy tickets to go and see in London. And in the Royal Tournament, you know, soldiers would sort of assemble and dismantle cannons and things. And that was a public relations exercise. But apart from that, it's to be expected, I think, that the uh, British and the Americans and the Emiratis and the Saudis, I mean, the British are part of something that uh, we tend to regard as being the Yemen Quad. So you've got the Saudis, the United Arab Emirates, the British, and the USA. We know from the experience of Afghanistan and Iraq that the British and the American are very perfunctory in their approach to human rights, to international humanitarian law. And I don't think you need me to tell you that the same also applies in Saudi Arabia and in the United Arab Emirates. So I think it's a technical detail. We can go into the the, the many aspects and the ramifications of we it. We will, uh, but forgive me as a long-serving parliamentarian myself, uh, it's not a technical matter if the government declares in the House of Commons that no British military personnel are involved in the war, are in Yemen. And it turns out to be, in Bob's words, unsurprising that they in fact are. Well, the British government has not... Uh, acknowledge that there are British troops fighting on the ground in Yemen. I've been in Yemen also. I've been in the Hadramaut. I've been in these places, uh, and, and, I, and I know something about the Houthi insurgency. It's not surprising um, to us that the British government would fail to acknowledge the presence of British troops in Yemen, but David Cameron in 2016, when he was the Prime Minister, acknowledged that the British military was assisting the Saudi UAE coalition, so-called, against the Houthis. So I think, you know, in, in, in that sense, you know, it's, it's in, in this country, we have a separation of power. So the parliament may have been lied to, but in 2019, the Court of Appeal in London ruled that the British government had actually acted unlawfully by continuing to sell weapons to the Saudi Arabians and the UAE to drop bombs on civilians in Yemen uh, without undertaking any kind of appraisal of the damage to ordinary people's lives that those weapons were, were causing. The Court of Appeal said that the actions of the British government were irrational and unlawful, and irrational because they didn't inquire. So that's the, that's the separate, that's the, if you like, the judiciary holding the legislature to account. So, um, well, you know, you are a parliamentarian. I won't, I won't um, tangle with you on how surprising or how unacceptable this. I think most people in the United Kingdom and across the Middle East would not be very surprised to hear that parliaments get lied to. As surprised as the police chief in Casablanca to discover there was gambling going on uh, in uh, Tangier. Uh, Sarah Kasim, there you have it. Uh, Britain that uh, occupied your country as a, a colonial asset, um, treated your people uh, with real brutality as late as the 1960s when the the Beatles were number one in the hit parade. We were shooting down Yemenis in the Kreta uh, district uh, in Aden. 
did it come as a shock to you that we might be back to our old tricks? Um, not really. I mean, in fact, probably British will know how the ways how to be in Yemen. Um, they will know probably more ways than Saudis and UAE. Uh, they know the region very well. Um, it's quite sad, though, because it's in the expense of civilians. Um, in Yemen, people are at the brink of a famine. So if this hasn't moved people's heart and the government here to take action, that really shocks me because of the stage that Yemen is right now. And then there's the Human Rights Watch report that in the very airport where our soldiers are allegedly based, uh, there is widespread use of torture, disappearance, the whole nine yards of extraordinary rendition and all of the brutality that we saw in Afghanistan, we saw in Iraq. It's happening in your country in an airport where we're based. Yes, and really and truly, they don't have the right to be there because the Houthis are not there. They are on the north in Sana'a. So there is no reason for the British troops or the Saudis to be there, unless if it's for other reasons. Well, let me posit to one reason and the reason I happen personally to believe. The British are there to assist the secession uh, of South Yemen, the return to the status quo ante before the reunification of the country. In other words, the partitioning of your country for selfish uh, reasons, so that they can control the gateway to the sea. Yes, and every the partition, it's only going to be in favor for British and Saudis and other countries that that want these um, to um, take over Yemen. Well, let's uh, hear from Dr. Hala Diab, uh, who's based in Leicester in England. She's a broadcaster, screenwriter, author, producer, and TV commentator on Middle East and North African affairs. Dr. Hala, welcome to the show. Dr. Hala, in your understanding, are British troops operating in Yemen? It's very not clear whether they are there or not. This is based on some reports and some speculation of some journalists or writers or witnesses or on the ground people from Yemeni Kabilas or somebody. But if they were there or if they are there, basically they would be there in order to provide logistical support or military training to the forces, to the soldier forces, or in order for um, other um, uh, aims, uh, especially, you know, to uh, preserve certain archaeological values or artifacts that Yemen has. And this is something we knew. Uh, we don't know for sure, but we know from the scenarios in, in Iraq and in Libya and other um, places, war zones where uh, Western forces were involved. What does this tell us about the UK's foreign policy with regards to Yemen? As you know, the, the, the Yemen situation is very critical and sensitive, especially because of the humanitarian crisis um, and um, because of the involvement of Saudi in Yemen, and which many people in Britain and the British public have uh, not happy with the involvement of uh, Britain in uh, the war in Yemen. And also they denounce the involvement of Saudi Arabia in war against Yemen. So that's why one of the reasons why if Britain was involved uh, in, the, in, in Yemen, uh, they will not really uh, make it very clear because of the British uh, public um, uh, refusal of the involvement of uh, of British forces in Yemen. Number two is because Britain, as you know, recently has cut foreign aid support. Um, and that because of the coronavirus and other things, financial uh, difficulties that Britain is having. And to cut that and to go and get involved in a war um, against uh, civilians would be a big thing against the Tory government in the UK. And that's why maybe they, if they were involved, they will keep it secret. If this story is true, and it appears to be true, why is Britain doing this in secret, clandestinely? 
part of the historical uh, British uh, diplomacy where the, you know, Saudi Arabia is an ally of, of Britain and um, they cannot really uh, ditch their interest and uh, their mutual uh, relation uh, with um, Saudi Arabia, especially now after Brexit, there might, might be prospect uh, for uh, trade um, with Saudi Arabia, commercial uh, 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 relationship. So uh, they are doing it in secret in order not to um, kind of uh, abandon uh, the Saudi government, but at the same time, they will not uh, be on the bad side or they will have a criticism from the British public. Dr. Halla, is it in your understanding only British troops that are operating in Yemen or might other countries also be similarly engaged? Of course it will be, but it's very you know, difficult when it comes to Yemen to know exactly who is on the ground and who is operating from regional or international forces. That's mainly because there is no media interest uh, as much as it were in Syria or if we say in other uh, war uh, conflicts in the Middle East. And also because of the uh, pressure that Saudi forces or Saudi government has on a uh, um, humanitarian situation, humanitarian um, aids to reach Yemen. So it's very difficult to know who is operating and are they there in order to provide aid and support to civilians? Do you think that British troops in Yemen will be staying there for long? It's, it's very also highly unlikely that Britain wants to get involved more in uh, international war or in international military support, mainly because of the financial situation, economic difficulties that Britain is having pro after um, uh, COVID and the lockdown and all the you know financial expenses uh, that incurred uh, during the lockdown from NHS and also with supports of uh, unemployment and all of this. Um, so it might be, that's why they're keeping it in secret, I think, because in a way it, it shows support to the uh, Saudi forces who are a very important ally and friends to the West. But at the same time, they are not going completely to say we are supporting the involvement in Yemen because it will be liability to the British government. If they say, okay, we will support uh, logistically or military training, and then it will be difficult. It will be a long term that we have seen that in Afghanistan, for example, or Libya. So they do not want to, um, you know, pledge to uh, sub, uh, to be involved in, in uh, Yemen war, but at the same time, they don't want to upset the Saudi. That's why this kind, if they were there, it will be in small, small number, and it will be also uh, not, uh, you know, in, in secret. Bob, it's, it's mission creep, to say the least, isn't it? First, we were supplying the the arms uh, then we put people in the command and control cell inside Saudi Arabia itself now seems by common currency that we've got soldiers inside what if some of them are killed if they're captured we'll be we'll be drawn further into this quicksand won't we well, not necessarily. They um, they will have strict uh, sort of parameters onto what their mission is in country. Um, typical roles of the SF, as you said. Well, in support of the GCC, it's more logistic and intelligence support. Um, in terms of SF on the ground, they're more they they do two major things. One is protect uh, SIS intelligence officers that might well be working on the ground and their agents, etc. Um, that's one of their roles. The other is to provide training to the Saudi special forces. Uh, another one, they're all capable of calling in airstrikes. They're all qualified air controllers in that sense, or facts, all air controllers. But that doesn't mean necessarily they are calling in airstrikes on behalf of the Saudis. They could be training the Saudis, special forces, to do that. They also work in the same way. And it's the Saudi Air Force. So it would be unlikely that Britain would be calling in a Saudi airstrike on anywhere. And if they did, they would be minimising collateral damage, quite frankly, um, because they'd be extremely concerned if they didn't, or the, the airstrike would not get authorised if there was a chance of collateral damage. That's not what we do. It's not what they what they do. They've got various roles. Uh, they always tend to hide out on an airfield in a fob, in a hangar. They keep themselves to themselves. And it's highly likely if there is some exploitation facility up the road where people are being interrogated, then that is not necessarily anything to do with them because 
interrogation or debriefing tends to be an intelligence function and is not an SF function. Hugh, Dr. Haller was right, wasn't she, that actually the only reason any of this can be happening, with our involvement at least, is that there's almost zero media and therefore political public interest in this. If it were in Syria or even Libya, uh, let alone if it was in Ukraine, uh, it would be very big news indeed. But sorry to say, Yemen is news in brief, isn't it? It's news in brief because it's a dangerous place for journalists to operate. I mean, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a rule of thumb in human rights abuses that in the dark corners of the world, dark deeds take place. And the dark corners of the world are dark because there are no journalists to shine any light on the dark deeds that are taking place. So, so that's uh, an obvious point. I mean, I think taking issue with something you were saying about the game plan for the British being secession once again of a sort of, you know, retro Aden protectorate going back to 1963, uh, I, would, I would, you know, disagree with that analysis simply on the grounds that it seems to me to be a kind of colonial view of kind of British mastery of foreign lands. And it is the case that the British were the first colonial power in the Middle East. The East India Company was very interested in putting soldiers on the ground in the Red Sea because they didn't like the fact that kind of pirates were marauding and attacking their ships that were trying to supply the Raj in India. So the British were, you know, in their pomp, the colonial power that had a strategic master plan, which might have been the secession of this country or of that country, but Britain is way beyond that now. That's over. Sure, and, uh, 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 there is a southern secession movement. Yes. It is strong. Uh, the UAE is financially backing it. It will probably end up owning the port at Aden. I didn't mean that Britain would become again the colonial power, but that Britain but, but is assisting. I take that point. It's assisting because it no longer writes the colonial narrative. Sure. That's now written by the Americans and the Saudis, and to some extent by the Emiratis. And the tragic thing for the British, uh, and for a country which post-Brexit, Dr. Hallard talked about the predicament that Britain finds itself post-Brexit, you know, impoverished, its trading options kind of shrinking by the minute. BAE and the weapons sales to the Saudi Arabia are an important factor in Boris's master plan. Now, the problem is that the British have been drawn into this dispute where they have no reasonable, and they have no reason to be there because essentially they have been allowed to become an accomplice in the devastation of the country and the killing of over 100,000 Yemeni civilians. Uh, uh, Sarah made a very, very interesting point about, um, you know, the, 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 the east of the country. I mean, the extraordinary thing about being uh, way off in the Hadramaut, which is where it's alleged that these operatives are, is that there are no Houthi positions there. No, no, of course. <laughs> I mean, that no one, you, you talked earlier, what would happen if these operatives were killed? They're not going to be killed. Because the only... Well, they might be killed by missiles. They might be killed by their own missiles, but they're not going to be killed by the, you know, Houthi militants who are chained in the dungeons at the adjoining building of the airport. So it's a safe place. What politicians, when they very rarely go on the news and talk about Yemen, don't explain is that these problems came out of foreign interference. In the first place. In the first place. Watch more of this after the break. Stay tuned. You're watching Kali Mohorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, discussing Yemen but also British involvement in the Yemen. Are British forces secretly operating inside Yemen in the Saudi-led coalition war on the people there? Bob, uh, it's not going well, the war. Uh, despite all the weapons that have been sold to them, despite our expertise, whatever it is, in the command and control room, and now despite the presence of our forces there. And if there are 50 there, there might be another 50 somewhere else. Uh, and yet the coalition isn't winning this war. What's the point of it all? Well, um, the only British involvement is there really to target terrorism. And I don't mean Houthi. Uh, I mean sort of Al-Qaeda and, uh, and ISIS, et cetera, there. So really they're focusing on that side of it. And 
one of the four pillars of why the GCC are there are to try and counter Iranian influence. So um, as they see it, people are being supplied by Iran with weapon systems, um, some quite advanced. So ultimately, they will be there no, to not in Mara try, province as in, we've in just heard. Counter that. The, well, there, okay. are no, there are no Houthis there. So no, there are no Houthis there. Agreed, but they, they will be there basically to have a look at what's on the ground and you know find some ground truth uh, to be able to back brief and also um, try and counter Iranian influence wherever they feel that that is. Um, and so ultimately, yeah, one could say it's not going. It's obviously the worst humanitarian disaster in history. Uh, absolutely. So it's not going well from that point of view. Um, but ultimately, we don't know how successful the SF are actually being until you know exactly what they're doing and who against. You see what I mean? Forgive me you pressing you on this point, uh, but I was uh, disturbed, I should say, uh, with your contention that if we're based in one part of an airport and there's torture going on in another part, and I think we can accept that there is torture going on. The Human Rights Watch report is devastating. Uh, how is that not any of our responsibility? I, I, I'm not getting that. If I, if I knew somebody was being tortured in the next room to me, I would consider it my moral and probably legal responsibility to intervene on it. Well, don't forget, you're, you know, you're, on, you're on the base of a host nation. So ultimately, one, as I said, the SF will keep themselves in their own hangar out of the way of everyone else. They're not going to be... Sure, they can hear the screams. You know, not necessarily. I mean, that's why you have soundproofed rooms, etc. Uh, if you are doing torture. And, um, and ultimately, you know, it's another part of the base. Airfields are, tend to be rather large, especially in the Middle East where there's a lot of ground and a lot of space. They're larger than UK. So ultimately, it's somebody else's area. It belongs to another country. You think that why would you necessarily be involved would at all? That pass at Nuremberg, you think, as a, as a defence? I had a soundproof room. I didn't hear the screams. I did read the Human Rights Watch report, uh, but I didn't hear the screams. And anyway, it was on somebody else's land. Well, again, if you're, if you're a British you know, soldier serving in Yemen, um, you're yes, not, but Nuremberg, you, you, you can get the whole sort of Human Rights report. Absolutely. It's on the web. You know, you can download the news. But at the end of the day, you're not in a position to, well, to walk out to the host Actually, nation under, the Nuremberg, doing, under you know? the Nuremberg findings, it is your responsibility uh, to refuse to be in any way involved in, in crimes, in war crimes, in crimes against humanity. You get shot or hanged, uh, and a soundproof room ain't much of a, a defence. Again, if, it's, if you've not seen it, not been there, you could feasibly say... I know nothing about that. That's nothing to do with me. Sarah, must be distressing uh, for you to hear this discussion. Of course, because in my uh, my thoughts now that the British troops there are training someone else to attack me. So you can't justify that if you can't hear it, you don't know about it, because you are there to train someone else to take my land where I am in need for you to come and help me to get out of this. You see us dying. You see us in the street. There is no electricity in Aden now. They only have one hour, two hours of electricity throughout the day. Extremely hot weather, no water, nothing. Everybody uh, from the outside are attacking our country and stealing our country. They need that support. They desperately need that support. Yes, they are. They saying that some are seeing British troops there. They they haven't done anything to the Yemeni people. Therefore, some of the Yemeni there they don't even know why they are there. Some are aware. Some they are not because they are not uh, involved with the civilians there. However, we know that they are there to train someone else to attack us and kill us and take our land. So you, uh, I come back to this point, um, potentially guilty of uh, an overemphasis on, on parliamentary matters. But this situation would be at least tolerable if there was a debate in Britain about involvement in the war, if Parliament had voted to be involved in the war. Uh, then you could say our soldiers were there lawfully, rationally. But none of these things is uh, true. All of this is happening in the dark. Indeed. I mean, Bob makes the point 
uh, that the soldiers can't hear the, the cries of torture. And Bob is a former professional soldier. Professional soldiers are highly trained operatives who take orders. I mean, I think the real question is not whether some individuals who have been parked in a garage adjacent to a torture cell should go and take responsibility of what's happening. And the blood that is on anybody's hands is on the hands of our political, our elected political leaders who have colluded with this disgraceful policy. I mean, the, way, the, the justification historically for torture was the so-called war against terror. Um, if you can demonize your opponents, then the Geneva Conventions no longer apply. And I think the interesting point that Bob made was uh, about you know, the involvement of Al-Qaeda and, and uh, Islamic State in Yemen. The other complex element in this, of course, is religious factionalism. Uh, and you have a, a country like Yemen in which there is a kind of uh, Shiite, uh, a substantial Shiite minority uh, that are engaged in a tribal and religious war to some extent against the Sunni majority. And, 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 and that's... Actually, they're all Zaydis. Uh, the, this is a false dichotomy, Sunni Shia, that the Saudis have injected into this picture uh, to make people uh, see it as an existential uh, threat uh, from Iranian-backed Shia. As a matter of fact, even, even the Muslim Brotherhood in Yemen are Zaydis, the same, if you like, Islamic current uh, as all the other parties. Except you're right that one group are supported by the Saudis and another group are supported by Iran, but that's for political and maybe tribal reasons, but it isn't actually a sectarian conflict. Well, I, I mean, I take your point, but I don't personally believe that it is a false dichotomy. If it were a false dichotomy, it's one that's been introduced, as you suggest, into the equation by the Saudis. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, this is a proxy war to some extent. This is a war between the Saudis and the Iranians. Now, you know, it isn't a false dichotomy to say that there's a Sunni-Shia tension there. Mm -hmm. So I don't really accept um, your dismissal of that argument. But what I would say, and Dr. Haller touched on it, is that in my you know, fairly extensive survey of the information around this, there is no genuine, no convincing, no persuasive evidence of Iranian-backed uh, Houthi activity. And if there were to be, you know, because of the starvation, because of the social urgency, if there were to be kind of humanitarian, compassionate assistance, some material support, it would be dwarfed by a factor of hundreds by the assistance that the uh, Republic Yemen government is receiving from their so-called friends mm, quite uh, so. in Saudi and the US. And l let's cross to the US, uh, to Michigan, in fact, and talk to Yusuf Maori, who's an award-winning documentary filmmaker, journalist, and uh, Yemeni-American, but unable, I think, to travel to Yemen uh, for a variety of reasons. Let's uh, hear from Yusuf. You're welcome. Yusuf, in your understanding, are these allegations in this report true? Of course they're true. In fact, the British troops have existed in Al-Mahra province since 2018. This is nothing new. British and Saudi troops have existed in Al-Mahra province since 2018 for a number of reasons that they will not tell you about. One of those main reasons that the British troops exist in Al-Mahra is because, first and foremost, they want to secure the Saudi oil pipeline that stretches from Saudi borders through the district of Al-Mahra into the Arabian Sea. That's one reason, but that's not the main reason. One of the main reasons for these foreign troops existing in Yemen is because they actually want to establish permanent military bases and military airfields all around Yemen, just as the UK and uh, US government did in Afghanistan and did in Iraq. And the strategy here seems to be they want to establish these uh, military bases all around uh, Yemeni coastal lines and on Yemeni islands. Uh, these military manifestations, as we see, are uh, in the island of Sagatra, in the island of El Mayun, where the UAE and the British government is establishing a military airfield. And as we know, the UAE government is establishing and is occupying the island of Sagatra. And 
what I think this is in preparation for is an all out war on Yemen from all four corners by a NATO like alliance consisting of US, UK, and other Western troops, along with their Saudi, UAE, uh, Arab allies. And I think their plan in the near future is to attack Yemen from all corners. And they want to use these, these military bases that they're establishing in the east, west, north, south of Yemen to attack the Ansar Allah back government stationed in Sana'a. And of course, the goal here is to restore the Hadi back uh, government into power in order to maintain US and Western uh, interest over Yemen land. You mentioned our bases in Afghanistan and Iraq, but these were run openly. Uh, why would we be running this operation in secret? Well, the reason why it's hidden is because it's going to be a preemptive strike. Right now, what we're seeing is the Saudi-backed coalition forces waging war on Yemen with uh, military and logistical support from U.S. and from the U.K. government. But what we're going to see now form and be uh, come to existence in the, in the near future is a NATO-like alliance, which is going to uh, uh, include direct military intervention by NATO-like forces, you, uh, you know, which is going to consist of UK and, and, and British troops. And uh, what they're going to do, as I mentioned, is they're going to work with the coalition forces and they're actually going to intervene militarily directly. And they want to do this from uh, all corners of Yemen. We're talking about in, you know, from, the, from the province of Al-Hudaydah, from Al-Mahra, from the province of Madib, from the uh, southern provinces controlled by the coalition forces, they need to do this because that's the only way they can bring Yemen back into the folds of Sa the, you know, the Saudi shackles and Western supervision. Uh, they've lost the war on the ground so far. So now Saudi Arabia and the UAE, they need to call their big daddy and they need to get them involved in the war in order to put, up, uh, put together a coalition force that will uh, attempt to uh, retake Yemen and bring it back to the uh, Western Saudi-backed Hadi government. So make no mistake about it, George, there's going to be a, a NATO-like alliance formed and created to attack Yemen in order to maintain Western interests over Yemeni land. And again, in order to bring the Hadi-backed government back into power. And they need all military preparations to do this because as we have seen on the ground, they lost across the board. Um, so this is what's happening right now with the US uh, military uh, uh, activities happening around the Red Sea. This is actually a strategic uh, way for, for, for the US to send a warning to Ansar Allah that if Ansar Allah does not come to terms and if Ansar Allah does not agree uh, to a, uh, a U.S.-friendly back peace initiative, as Saudi Arabia proposed a couple of months ago, then the U.S. will be forced to intervene in Yemen militarily from land, air, and sea if the Houthis don't agree to a deal that secures U.S. interests over Yemen, if the Houthis don't agree to a deal that uh, somehow, some way, restores the Hadi back government into power in Yemen. Um, so this is something that I believe is going to happen happen in the future, and we see the preparations taking place today. Is it likely that only British troops are operating in Yemen in this way, or uh, perhaps more likely that other countries also were doing so? Well, we're talking about British troops existing on the ground. We're talking about U.S. soldiers on Yemeni soil. We're talking about UAE. We're talking about, of course, Saudi uh, troops on the ground. Um, pretty soon there's going to be French and German troops in Yemen. Like I said, this is going to be, they're on the verge of forming this NATO-like alliance consistent of Western uh, nations who will directly wage war on Yemen. And the reason why they want to do this and they need to do this sooner rather than later is because they want to prevent the, 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 the Sana'a-backed government, the, the Ansar Allah-backed government from uh, uh, um, uh, building a strong, military air defense system. So they need to act now. And this is why we see these preparations taking place. The uh, Saudi Arabia and the coalition forces along with their Western allies, they would prefer to wage an all out war on the Houthis, AKA on Saudi Allah now rather than later because they haven't won anything politically. They haven't, uh, they haven't forced on Saudi Allah to compromise on a peace deal that the US approves of. Um, and, and, and 
for that reason alone, they have to try to gain momentum and try try to gain leverage and an upper hand militarily. And in order for that to happen, Western troops have to get involved and rescue and aid their out of back uh, uh, coalition forces who have failed across the board in this war since 2015. Yusuf, for, for how long do you think the British or any other country similarly engaged can possibly keep that engagement, that involvement a secret? I don't think, I don't, I don't think it's, it's a secret anymore. The U.S. ambassador to Yemen has acknowledged that there, uh, you know, has, has acknowledged and uh, confirmed that U.S. or uh, British troops are on the ground in Al Mahra district. And the reason uh, he claims is because this was in uh, response to the request of the Hadi back government in order to counter, ter- you know, quote unquote terrorism. If you know, if they really wanted to counter terrorism, what about the terrorism that's happening on a mass scale from states? like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, who have uh, bombed Yemen almost every province. They've, they, they've bombed and killed innocent children in hospitals. They've bombed and killed innocent children on a bus on their way to school. That's the biggest type of terrorism that the Yemeni people are witnessing. So if the British ambassador to Yemen is claiming that the ex- existence of British troops in Al-Mahda is to counter terrorism, when you look at how Yemenis are viewing the conflict, they view the UK troops as the biggest aggressors and the ones who are committing uh, acts of terrorism by supporting the Saudi-backed regime with military supplies and military equipment that kill innocent Yemeni children. And uh, this is why, you know, the, the war has continued since, you know, for, for, for over seven, for seven years because of the support of the UK government and because of the support from the US government to Saudi Arabia and, and the coalition forces who have uh, the only thing they've really succeeded in is killing innocent people and starving people by imposing a uh, economic blockade on, on Yemen that's preventing humanitarian aid and vital supplies from entering the country. Bob, all out war, total war. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, all wars are wrong, to be fair, but um, ultimately, yeah, NATO is not about to invade Yemen in the slightest. Uh, or a coalition of that na- that nature. It's not about us invading them and, and doing a ground war. Um, at the end of the day, forces that also belong to NATO are also eligible to put themselves up for a UN tour. And ultimately, the UN wants to intervene on the humanitarian side of things. Building military bases makes perfect sense, not necessarily for aggressive action to invade anywhere, but because you need a huge amount of logistic support to bring in rations. And you can and, always leave them the behind in the middle of the night, else, like, like uh, the US has just done in Afghanistan. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you can use them as a... They, they are basically an inroad and outroad out of the country. Um, you need to keep them out of the way. Um, they're not necessarily an offensive thing. They're just a base. You need it to be able to bring people in for peacekeeping UN forces. But the, the armies of the UN forces are the same ones that are in NATO as they are from around the globe. So there's not about to be some huge invasion, not from NATO anyway, certainly. I'd say that. Hugh, uh, here's a conundrum. Uh, President Biden made hardly any electoral commitments during his campaign. One of the very few that he did was to disengage from this war in Yemen and to put distance uh, between the U.S. administration and the, frankly, criminal uh, administration in Saudi Arabia. Was that just a a pre-election promise to be broken, or is something going on here? Well, I think something is going on here. Uh, Politicians make lots of promises when they're on the hustings. As I said earlier, Trump uh, and Mike Pompeo designated the Houthis, a terrorist organization in January this year, and Biden turned that around fairly promptly, took them off that list. Not that that list is a meaningful thing uh, to start with. And the difficulty, of course, is if you stop selling smart bombs to the Saudis, they just go back to using the unsmart bombs, which kill even more civilians. And that's one of the problems. I mean, I thought what Yusuf was saying was obviously very uh, informed, and and respect to him for his, his knowledge and his eloquence. I mean, I'm not sure that I would necessarily see uh, the ramping up of uh, a Western invasion of Yemen as being a very distinct or immediate possibility, simply because I think the perpetrators of these war crimes, and they are war crimes, let's be, let's be honest, I think they are already beginning to see 
the error of their ways. That's not to say they're going to come to the negotiation table anytime soon. But in 2019, Mohammed bin Zayed, the de facto leader of the UAE, he sort of pulled back from UAE doing what, what, what it was doing to assist the Saudis. And I think even kind of his friend Mohammed bin Salman, you know, in the, in the wake of the Khashoggi um, outrage, uh, there has been a kind of sense in which Interestingly, in the last six months, uh, uh, MBS has started to talk to the Houthis and about the need for negotiation. Obviously, that's cynical, but it's a sign that neither the Saudis nor the Emiratis see this ending well. And then, of course, you have Biden, we've just been talking about, who, whether or not he's going to put his money where his mouth is, is talking about kind of going in a more peaceful direction. So we're in a kind of intriguing, paradoxical situation post-Brexit of having the Yemen quad of killers hanging up their guns, all of them except for one, and that's the British government. It is whether to go on or or. Is it bloodier to go on or to go back? Uh, not reinforcing failure was always, I understood, a military principle. This war is a failure. Why would we reinforce it? Well, in a sense, we wouldn't reinforce it. Um, ultimately, as Pew and Sarah quite rightly said, you know, it's, it's the tribal politics of Yemen is very complex. Um, you know, as it was the president himself, Salah, who often said, you know, governing Ye Yemen was like dancing on the heads of snakes. At the end of the day, it's an incredibly complex place. It's not black and white. You're not always in, look at Afghanistan, Iraq, and the results there as well. It's the same sort of thing. So ultimately, it, it's all about long term bringing people to the negotiation table and finding an accord there, uh, hopefully, in the sense of UN auspices and bringing in that humanitarian aid. Selling weapons to Saudi is, yes, they get used there, but that's not, as in a sense, direct. We don't sell them to Saudi deliberately to use in Yemen. Uh, and if you didn't sell Saudi weapons, somebody else will. All countries sell weapons. Mm. It's part of hard currency. Russia needed it. That's the alibi Everybody of every needs. heroin dealer Look, on every street. Go, every yeah, street. but again, yeah, even a heroin dealer could say, well, I'll stop selling it if you stop demanding it from me. You know, the US has got a huge drugs problem. And it's like, well, the Colombians could quite yeah. rightly say, well, tell your public not to snort it up their nose, yeah, then, uh, ultimately, sure. and we'll stop it. Uh, our courts have declared those sales to be unlawful and irrational, but we're still selling. Yeah. Well, that, again, as you said, that's a point really for um, you know, the judiciary to come against legislation, really, and, and stop that if it's unlawful. Sarah, you've heard your country described by, in this case, a quotation of, of your former president as snakes whose heads have to be danced upon. Uh, the, uh, we've heard about tribalism and sectarianism and complexities and so on. Is that how it all looks to you as a Yemeni? As a Yemeni, everybody that have governed Yemen has been the wrong people because they have not been elected to govern Yemen. They have destroyed the country. They've sold it out. They've sold the country out. I cannot say you would, we have the you right government. You'd include uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh in Of course, that. yes. Um, look where Yemen is now and how he left Yemen by the hand of Houthis. Everybody that has a charge on, on Yemen, sadly, have destroyed Yemen. So I would blame the government, our government, before anyone else because they've sold, it, uh, they've sold us out. I am not with the division of Yemen. I still hope that if the Brit British government will get involved in anything, that would be to bring peace to Yemen. How distant does that seem to you now? There is hope. Every Yemeni back there has hope that Yemen will come back. But is it rational hope or just blind faith? Blind faith. But we believe something will come up, something will happen. If you hear how young people speak about the future there, you would be surprised that they're going through all of this and yet they are fighting. It's just that we're waiting for the right people to take the chance to lead us. And to everybody else that there, leave us alone, leave the country. Just look where we are now. We need to live, we need to survive. By this stage, humanity should come up before anything else because people are literally dying there. Well, from my point of view, British involvement in Yemen is not going to end any more happily 
than our involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq have ended, and Libya for that matter, and Syria for that matter. Hugh agreed with me earlier, indeed he proposed the point, uh, that Britain is a faded power. It is not uh, dictating the colonial future of places like Yemen, which begs the question why we are there, how we can justify any level of involvement, whether the supply of weapons, the training of Saudi personnel, or just staying in a Saud-proof room just out of earshot of the torture and the screams, I simply cannot fathom. Moreover, I happen to believe, because I have faith in my countrymen, that if the British people knew uh, the depth of our involvement in this squalid little affair, in Yemen, a little affair not for the people of Yemen, a massive affair for them, but a little affair in geopolitics, a far-off country of which we know little, apparently care little, and certainly in terms of media coverage are told little. If the British people knew, I feel sure they'd be demanding that these 50 British special forces in Al-Qaeda airport, would board a plane and come home without further delay. It's been a fascinating discussion. I hope you agree. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kalimahorra on Al-Mayadeen Television. Thank you very much for watching.